going to talk about fluid and electrolytes. Um, ABGs we did in class, so please pay attention to that lecture I gave in class and review it, okay? So first I'm going to talk about fluid volume overload. And what fluid volume overload means, the person has too much fluid on board. Okay, so they're going to be overhydrated. And we worry about this because the complication of fluid volume overload is pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure, like an exacerbation of a, a congestive heart failure. And we are living in a society now that has more older adults. So it's most likely that most of the people you care for are going to be prone to exacerbations in chronic congestive heart failure, okay, in pulmonary edema. So who's at risk? Older adults, because they have reduced kidney function. You have to understand that, that an older adult cannot handle the same fluid load. They're going to retain more fluids than a younger adult, okay? Anybody who's taking in too much in syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic syndrome we talked about in the cancer lectures. Okay, because they have so much fluid on board, their labs are going to be diluted. For example, they'll have a low hemoglobin and hematocrit, so that's low H and H. They'll have a decreased BUN. They'll have decreased specific gravity of their urine, so the urine's going to be more like water. Uh, and they'll have low sodium, okay? Because they have low sodium, any time you hear sodium high or low, think neurological problems, okay? So they could have seizures with low sodium. So you have to watch that. Um, key points are the expected findings. You're going to expect to see edema. The patient may have anisocra. Anisocra is an all-over body edema. Obviously, they're going to have weight gain because fluid makes you gain weight. Now, students oftentimes don't remember this, but when the body's under stress, the patient is going to have tachycardia, okay? So fluid volume overload tachycardia, they're going to have a bounding pulse, meaning the pulse is going to be greater than plus two. Plus two is the normal strength of a pulse. So plus three and four means a increased amplitude of pulse. So we call that bounding, okay? They're going to have tachypnea. They're going to be breathing fast. That's what that means. Hypertension, because there's so much fluid in their vessels, their blood pressure is going to go high. They have altered mental status and are prone to seizures. Remember what I said about the sodium, because the sodium is going to be hemodiluted, so they are going to be at risk for altered mental status. Anytime somebody has a new cough, you have to think to yourself, an older adult especially, that they may be developing um, CHF or they may be developing pulmonary edema. That's one of the early signs. They'll, they may have crackles in their lungs and dyspnea. Pink frothy sputum always means pulmonary edema. There could be different causes, but if somebody has pink or frothy sputum, think pulmonary edema. So you need to know those are signs and symptoms. Now, with pulmonary edema, I already told you a new cough, crackles and dyspnea, and pink frothy sputum. The chest x-ray is going to show that the pulmonary areas are congested. Okay, so they're going to be short of breath. They're going to have orthopenia. Orthopenia means they can't lay flat. They're going to be trying to like sit up. Um, you may have to rest them over the bedside table sitting up, get the head of the bed up, and they're going to have a low O2 sat if they have pulmonary edema or exacerbation of their CHF. All right, so what we're going to do about it is we want to drain the body. Okay, so they're going to need diuretics and or dialysis. Um, restrict sodium and fluids, um, assess daily weights, eyes and nose, and make sure you're watching the sodium level. You want to make sure if they're having an exacerbation of CHF or they're having trouble bleeding due to pulmonary edema, raise the head of the bed first, then you can put on the O2. Um, you can also give um, diuretics after that. Um, they're going to be on bed rest. Anytime somebody has edema, we put them on bed rest. It helps the kidneys to perfuse better, and hopefully that will help in them excreting um, the fluid as urine. You want to turn to Q because anybody with edema is going to be at risk um, for skin breakdown. And when they're in bed, make sure you're checking that sacral area because that's an area that where edema can collect, definitely. They need to be taught to report a weight gain of two pounds a day or three pounds a week. 
And our goal or our, our outcome should be euvolemia, which means uh, an almost an almost equal intake versus outtake. Okay, and lung sounds clear. We definitely want that. Now we're going to compare that with fluid volume deficit. So fluid volume deficit, I'm on this screen over here, is um, basically dehydration. So there's a lack of fluid or in, due to insufficient intake or excessive loss. Okay, so older adults are at risk for fluid volume deficit because they have decreased concentration ability of the kidneys, but they also have a decreased thirst reflex. And the other thing that um, older adults do is they don't like to drink a lot in the evening hours because it makes them get up at night. So as you age, you start having nocturia and you get up to um, void frequently during the night. So they don't want to do that. So they will um, self restrict their fluid. Okay. Anybody with a prolonged fever, anybody with the three D's, diarrhea, diuresis, or diaphoresis, anybody that's MPO, anybody with a bowel obstruction, you can um, sequester five liters of fluid in your bowel if you're obstructed. Um, anybody hemorrhaging, obviously. So the findings, flat neck veins is um, something you are going to see. Um, you can put them supine to see if their neck veins flatten. Um, remember the signs and symptoms. This is important. You can remember the mnemonic dehydration if mnemonics work for you, but they're going to have a dry mucous membrane and furrowed tongue. And this is because when you're dehydrated, your sodium level is going to go up. The earliest sign is going to be tachycardia. But unlike fluid volume overload with the bounding pulse, people with fluid volume deficit are going to have a thready pulse. They're going to be tachypnic because their body's under stress. So tachycardia and tachypnea hypotension, and they could suffer from orthostatic hypotension with dizziness, so that's a safety problem. Um, young sunken fontanelle, you'll learn about that next semester. Decreased skin turgor. Remember, if you get a question with an older adult, skin turgor is not accurate, okay? Otherwise, you can test for skin tenting, okay? Refill the capillaries. They're going to be sluggish. The capillaries are going to be sluggish. So in other words, their capillary refill is going to be greater than uh, three seconds. Uh, attitude change, and this is because of the sodium, confusion, weakness, fatigue. They'll have thirst because of the high sodium. They'll have uh, weight loss, uh, elevated temperature when you're dehydrated. They're going to have a high specific gravity. Remember, the higher, the drier. Okay, and low urine output. Okay. So we're worried about hypovolemic shock, and you'll learn more about that next semester, but we need to replace the fluids. And usually it's replaced with maybe a bolus. Um, you have to be careful with old people. Um, you're worried about acute kidney injury because if the kidney, if you have low volume, fluid volume deficit, right, so you have low blood levels in your veins, in your, your arteries, your kidneys aren't going to be perfused and you could develop an acute kidney injury because of that, okay? Also, if you're dehydrated, you're gonna be more prone to DVT. So remember those are complications of fluid volume deficit, very important, because you need to be um, realize what can happen to the patient, be on the lookout for those things, all right? We're gonna worry about falls due to orthostatic hypotension, so you know what to do about that. May do a Romberg test. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the semester. Um, and then they, we're going to worry about, I, get, I told you, decreased perfusion, which can lead to an acute kidney injury, DVT, and falls. Those are the main things you're going to uh, worry about. Um, you're going to insert an IV. You want a 20 gauge to give fluids. You're going to give an IV fluid bolus. Push PO fluids as tolerated. Um, monitor vital signs, check for orthostatic hypotension. All right, so I told you about checking the pulse amplitude. You want plus two or higher. That's good. Encourage patients to change positions in bed. Um, instruct to rise slowly. Monitor their weight during fluid resuscitation. So you're supposed to, during fluid resuscitation, that means when you're replacing fluids, um, you're supposed to weigh Q8 during the resuscitation period. Um, monitor urinary output. 
Now, we would like in our evaluation to see the patient alert and oriented times three, have a urinary output of at least 30 mLs per hour, um, no more dizziness, moist red mucous membranes, and pink skin. Okay, all the things we want. The specific gravity, if we treated the patient correctly, should be within the normal range, and they should have improved skin turgor. Okay, so remember that. Now with sodium, I told you um, sodium helps us maintain our blood pressure. That's why we tell people with high blood pressure to not eat as much sodium. It assists in muscle contraction and the transmission of nerve impulses. So when you hear hypo or hyperintremia, think nervous system. Something's going to go awry in the nervous system. Um, also, where sodium goes, water follows, okay? So for hyponatremia, okay, there's many causes of hyponatremia and hypernatremia, but I want you to focus on the signs and the symptoms, okay? So for hyponatremia, okay, remember neuro, they're going to have stupor, they could be in a coma, they're going to be anorexic, lethargy, so they're having like a decrease in their LOC. Tendon reflexes are going to be decreased. They're going to have tachycardia because the body's under stress and they're going to have a thready pulse. They'll have limp muscles, orthostatic hypotension, seizures, and stomach cramping. All right, you want to monitor the weight. And then um, you're going to give isotonic fluids, so LR or 0.9%. Monitor the LOC and vital signs, seizure precautions, definitely. Liberalize salt in the diet. Um, and they, it, depending on the reason they have it, they may be put on a fluid restriction, but don't worry about that right now. Foods high in sodium. This is really important. You have to know the foods high in sodium, not just for this, but when we get to the cardiac lecture, you'll have to know it as well. So anything processed foods, anything in a can or a bag probably has high sodium. Ketchup, dried fruit, don't fall for it just because it says fruit. When they dry it, there's sodium added to it. Cheese and pickles, okay? So make sure you know the foods that are high in um, sodium. And then with hypernatremia, okay, they're going to have fluid retention, okay? If they're holding on to sodium, they'll hold on to fluid. They'll be restless, irritable, anxious, and confused. Again, neurological symptoms. Increased blood pressure if they have increased volume. They'll have pinning edema, decreased urinary output, dry mouth, um, low-grade fever, and thirst, tongue red and swollen, okay? So they need to eat a low-sodium diet and obviously avoid food high in sodium. They want to weigh daily, okay? If sodium is all about the neurological system, then potassium is all about the heart. Okay, now with potassium, um, don't memorize like the causes. We're going to give you the causes we want you to know about. Like for example, furosemide is going to cause low potassium. You got to know that. Okay, and we'll get into the other, you'll get into the other medications during the semester. I do want you to know if furosemide lowers the potassium, spiroaldactone can increase the potassium. Those are two things to know, but don't memorize all those. Okay, so if you have um, low potassium, okay, you can remember with the 9L, so they're going to have a low BP, so hypotension, and they'll be orthostatic, they'll be lethargic, low shallow respirations, Cardiac dysrhythmia, so tachycardia, like when you get VTAC, have PVCs. I don't expect you to know um, how to recognize those, but I'm just giving you an example. They'll be putting out lots of urine if they have hypokalemia. So hypokalemia creates a kind of nephrotoxic diabetes insipidus, and I know you don't know what that means yet, but with diabetes insipidus, so lots of urine is um, put out, okay? They'll have leg, leg cramps, limp muscles, which goes with lethargy, right? Low blood pressure, which goes with low BP, less stool. So 
people with hypokalemia are going to be constipated in hyperkalemia. They're going to have diarrhea, okay? Low amplitude of pulse, so thready, weak pulse. You definitely need to know these signs and symptoms, and you need to know the signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia. Both of them are going to cause, can cause cardiac problems. So you probably get an EKG on either high or low, okay? So with um, hyperkalemia, they're going to have muscle weakness. It's ascending. So what that means is it starts in the lower extremities and makes its way up. And what you're going to worry about is if it gets up near the rib cage, you, you'll worry before it gets there. So like when it gets to the hip area or high thighs, um, because they could have respiratory failure because it makes those intercostal muscles weaker. Okay, so the muscles around the rib cage get weaker. They're going to have um, low urine output, decreased cardiac uh, contractility. Okay, so they'll have thready pulse, low heart rate, hypotension. Uh, diarrhea, I talked about, muscle twitching, uh, and rhythm changes of their heart rhythm. Okay, so monitor for dysrhythmias, whether the potassium is high or low, and you need to get an ECG. All right, calcium gluconate is going to be given if if they have hyperkalemia for a dysrhythmia, all right? Um, so if they have hypokalemia, you're going to give potassium PO or IV drip. We never, ever, ever give potassium IV push. They must be voiding 30 milliliters an hour to give potassium. So you're going to have to check the urine output before you start a potassium drip. Check their respirations, monitor the cardiac rhythm. Always check a potassium before given digitalis because it increases digitalis toxicity. Um, check their hand grasp for strength. Monitor their bowel sounds to make sure that they're not um, slowing down um, and monitor the IV site. Okay. With um, high potassium, monitor for falls, monitor their breathing, obviously. Um, and there's some medications you're going to learn about in, in pharmacology that we give to decrease um, potassium. All right, foods high in K, potato with skin, banana, okay, oranges, tomatoes, you can read this, but these are the, the um, salt substitutes are also high in potassium. So patients that are on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, NSAIDs, you have to tell them um, to avoid sal uh, salt substitute because those medications also can increase your potassium. All right, uh, foods low in potassium include apples, corn, pineapple, grapes, and green beans. Okay, so you're gonna have to know the foods. Okay, hypocalcemia. Now, we talked about hyper, don't memorize these uh, causes, okay? We talked about hypercalcemia in the oncology lecture. It's a, a oncological emergency. So those same signs and symptoms I went over at that time stand. Remember, calcium is a sedative to the body except for the kidneys because they're going to have a high urinary output with high calcium. Okay? So um, the other thing is, so if calcium is a sedative to the body, when somebody has low calcium, they're going to have tetany, they're going to have convulsions, they're going to have Shavostex. Shavostex is when you tap right on the cheek in front of the facial muscle. You're going to tap on the cheek and you'll see facial twitching. Trosseos is when you blow up the blood pressure cuff, okay, and you let it stay blown up one to four minutes, and it's called carpal pedal spasm because they're going to, their hand is going to like spasm right here. Okay. So tetany arrhythmias, they will have arrhythmias as well. Um, and strider. So that's what you're worried about, occluding the airway and arrhythmias. Um, so they need to be on seizures and fall precautions, keep them calm and quiet, limit visitors because you don't want them getting excited. Um, administer vitamin D with the calcium. Encourage the foods high in calcium. So foods high in calcium, this is a key point, okay? So green leafy vegetables, dairy food, usually people know that. Um, salmon, sardines, and oranges are high in calcium. 
And then for hypercalcemia, we're going to avoid those foods. And then magnesium is very um, similar to calcium, okay? So if I have low magnesium, right, don't memorize the causes of the risk factors. If I have low magnesium, I'm going to have seizures, tetany, arrhythmias, rapid heart rate, vomiting, DTR, so that's um, tendon, deep tendon reflexes. They're going to be increased, hyperactive, okay? So you want, and they also have positive Chavaz text and Trasio signs. So we often say magnesium and calcium are BFFs because they both sedate and relax muscles, okay? So nursing care, you can give PO magnesium, you can give an IV magnesium, um, monitor the DTR's deep tendon reflexes Q1 hour. Monitor magnesium for clients on digitalis as well because um, it can lead to toxicity. So you must have calcium gluconate on hand or calcium chloride. Um, calcium chloride, calcium gluconate on hand to give if the respiratory rate decreases when you're giving magnesium. Okay, because you can overcorrect correct when somebody's getting magnesium and it will decrease the respiratory rate because remember magnesium's a sedative. So calcium gluconate will be the rescue drug for that. Okay, when it comes to ABGs, I think um, we had a really good lecture in class. I would encourage you to go look at your notes from that and remember to identify, you know, name the last name first by the pH and then determine the first name by using Rome to the pH. Okay, so if you're, you're not familiar with that, then just listen to the lecture on AVGs, and that should help you. And then bring any, of course, bring any questions you have to um, tutoring.